Well, good morning. I am grateful, we are grateful, my wife and I, to be in your presence this morning, uh, once again, to uh, be a part of this transition back to what we can now call our new normal, right? So I'm certain over these past few uh, 14, 15 months, it has been uh, quite a challenge for many of us to, uh, to center ourselves in worship and to gather, uh, and so it's delightful. Uh, to be able to be uh, face-to-face as opposed to being on Zoom and other formats in which we've had to accommodate uh, times of worship. I want to thank my friend Janice for such a marvelous uh, introduction and uh, also to, for Sandy and Mary and others who, whom I've communicated with uh, preparing for this time. I am thankful for your invitation to be with you today and we thank God for uh, the opportunity once again, to share a little bit of the insights uh, from our gospel message for today. Um, it has been um, quite, a, quite a while since I've actually been in a pulpit, so <laughs> As if you heard, I have been retired since November of 2019, then COVID hit, and I think I've preached only one other time uh, for a funeral service back at Oakdale Park. Uh, a few months ago. And so um, if I appear to be a little unsettled and nervous, um, it's because of two things. Uh, One is because this is my first time standing in front of you, uh, this part of God's venue. And secondly, it is just the sheer um, sort of semi-nervousness of just being back in this space. But if you pray for me, if you pray with me, I am certain that God is faithful and he will Bless our time together. He will bless his word unto the edifying of our souls. And so, uh, if you will, uh, the New Testament scripture has been already read for you, so I will not read that over in its entirety, but for those of you, perhaps in your preparation, have already read it several times, and many of you are very familiar uh, with this text as well. So, I would like to ask you to bow in a word of prayer as we unfold the lesson for today. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, we come now. We pause in your presence, praying that you would give us here ears to hear and to understand clearly the message that you want us to take away today, that you would bless the words of my mouth, the meditation of our collective hearts, O God, who is our strength and our redeemer. For we give thanks for all things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. And all of God's people said amen. So I don't know if this is interfering at all. It's good. We're good? All right. So, Mark 2, 1 through 17 is sort of the basis for the message for the day. And i just like to say that from the onset, that from the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Jesus went about breaking and resolving and removing barriers and dismantling religious, social, and economic caste systems that resulted in the divisions that separated people from God and separated them from one another. Mark tells us in his very fast-paced movement throughout this gospel, he tells us that Jesus was on the move. After his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness, Jesus went into Galilee, the scripture says, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, Jesus proclaimed. The time has come, kairos moment, this divine appointment. This time had come with the coming of Jesus into his, into his full-fledged ministry. The kingdom of God, he said, is near. Repent and believe the good news. So on his first uh, Galilean tour, as he began to preach this good news, he, he does several things. He calls to himself his first disciples. He drives out demons and evil spirits. And he heals a multitude, a multitude of sick folk all over the region. 
And of course, you know, by then his popularity was gaining. People sought him out to be touched by him, to be healed by him, to be recognized by him. And so we move into chapter 2 as, as Mark continues to uh, unfold this, this drama of Jesus' travel, of his being on the move. So Jesus now and his crew have returned to his, to his home base, the town of Capernaum. Many of you remember that he grew up in the town of Nazareth. That was the town of his birth. But Capernaum was his home base. That's where Jesus decided to strategically to be in a place where he could be able to reach uh, the multitudes with the message of the kingdom. So that was his home base. And we're told that he entered a certain house uh, in Capernaum. Some scholars believe that this indeed was the home of Simon Peter. They entered into this town unannounced, but soon the word got out that Jesus was back in Capernaum. And when the people heard that the miracle worker of Nazareth had returned, they flocked to where he was staying. Can you see them coming by the hundreds, maybe even by the thousands? And Jesus then again starts his preaching ministry. He was there in that house, and he said that the house was packed inside and out. There was standing room only. Now, I know that this is a marvelous place of worship, house of worship, and some of us certainly will be happy to someday to proclaim that when we gather on the Lord's day that there is standing room only. But because of what we've just gone through, we know that we still have to remain a little bit cautious and do our social distancing and respect the fact that we are not completely out of this pandemic, right? And so, but they said the house was packed. It was so filled uh, that there was no room. It was standing room only. And if you dared move from your spot, you would lose it. And so no one dared move. Every person stood their ground, did not give an inch. Have you, have you ever wondered reflecting on that scene, meditating on that scene, as you have read this scripture hundreds of times, perhaps. Have you ever wondered who was in that crowd and why they were there? Let, let's turn on for a minute, if we could use our sanctified imaginations, let's turn on our facial recognition and see if we can get a, peer, a peep inside who was there present in this space. They were, no doubt, the sick, the lame, the blind, the hungry, and the hurting. Yes, these were the folk that had been labeled misfits and misguided. These were the huddled masses longing to be free. They, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's who they were. But that wasn't all of them. There were others in that crowd that day, but they were, they were there as critics. They were there as those who were looking for some way to trap Jesus. They were the undercover operatives for a separatist party called the Pharisees. And the only reason that they were there was to gather evidence leading to the arrest, conviction, and ultimately to the crucifixion of Jesus. But everyone else, everyone else in that crowd, in that house that day, were doing what the Clark sisters sang about. Now, if you all don't know who the Clark sisters is, I, I would tell, ask you just to go and Google, and you will see these marvelous gospel singers, uh, all sisters, who, who made popular a song called, I'm Looking for a Miracle. I'm looking for a miracle, expecting the impossible. Just believe it and receive it, and God will perform it today. Hey, hey. <laughs> Everyone else came to see Jesus pull off some supernatural feat, some deed that was so indescribable. So, so what did Jesus do in response to these expectations? What did he do indeed? 
The scripture says he simply began to preach. Isn't that good news? He preached to them. Jesus knew exactly what they needed the most was the word of God, the good news of the gospel, the promise of the gospel, the liberating power of the gospel. And so he began to preach to them. Preaching the good news was one of the hallmarks in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is also, I would uh, encourage you to think this morning, that it is also one of the hallmarks of the true church. I love good singing of all types. Bluegrass and Irish jigs and psalms and hip-hop and gospel. I love good singing. I love good testimony, people standing up and saying, this is what the Lord has done for me. I love good praise and worship where we are uninhibited and whole bodily uh, worship is encouraged and we enter into that. I love good praise and worship. But there is nothing that blesses me more than preaching the good news of the Word of God. Not just my preaching, but being under the preaching of others who are anointed by God to preach the Word. Preaching is God's chosen strategy for saving fallen humanity and for transforming the kingdoms of man into the kingdoms of God. And so, so can we, we can all one day be what God has called us to be. Preaching is necessary for that task. But back to our text this morning. Jesus now moves out and begins to display his divine authority as we, as we travel along now around verses 3 to 5 and 7. Before Jesus, now standing in this crowded house, before he could finish preaching his message that day. And I don't know exactly what he preached. The scripture doesn't reveal that. But he was, in that, he was in his groove and he was preaching. But before he could finish the message, something happened that was so unusual, something so dramatic. Something happens. It says that four men carrying their paralyzed friend arrived at the house. And they believed that if they could just get this man to Jesus, then Jesus could heal his body. When they arrived at the house, the crowd was so large, the scripture says, that they could not get in. They couldn't go through the front door. They couldn't go through the back or the windows if they had them. They could not find any way into the presence of Jesus. And so they decided to go up top on the roof. Now, these rules weren't made like ours today with all of these geometric shapes. And it's common knowledge that the houses in that day were usually constructed of, of flat roofs uh, with a set of stairs running up one side of the house to give you access to the top, which was used much like what we use for our patios in our days. These rules were usually made of um, limber uh, timbers that would cross the top of the house timbers that were covered by layers of branches and then covered with layers of tile and clay and a thick layer of mud perhaps rolled and pressed and dried until it was perhaps rain-free, rain-proof. And so here in this scene, this dramatic scene develops, it unfolds. Jesus is preaching in this house, four men carrying their friends up to the staircase. Do you see them moving now up those stairs? And once they got to the top of the roof, they began to dig their way through and make a hole in the top of this roof and lower Jesus down into the presence, lower the man down on his mat into the presence of Jesus. Can you imagine the commotion that was going on? I mean, we had an interruption like that this morning in the midst of this service. I'm sure all of us would find it a little bit off-putting or something, right? Something strange is going on here. But I wondered, though, what the people thought when they saw that happening, what the crowd thought. Surely they had never seen anything this, like this happen in a worship service, and no doubt they were mystified by this occurrence. 
However, we don't have to wonder about how Jesus felt. Because he, he really tells us in verse 5, Mark tells us in verse 5, that when Jesus saw this unfolding in front of him, he looked with the discerning eye, with the eye of compassion. He gazed upon this scene, and what he saw was determined faith. He saw the determined faith of these five men, the paralyzed man and his four friends. And the text says that when he saw their faith, when he saw this determined faith that would not be denied, when he saw this determined faith that would not give up, when he saw these people go through extraordinary means to get someone into his presence, he said these words to the paralyzed man. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Another version says, take heart, son, take heart, your sins are forgiven. Did, did you hear that? Your sins are forgiven. This man was brought to Jesus for healing. He, he was brought to Jesus so that he would, he would be able to walk again, to find strength in his legs so that he could be productive again. He was brought to Jesus so that he could be upright again instead of flat on his back. But Jesus deals with his spiritual and emotional health before he deals with his physical health. Did you notice that? Sometimes I, I question myself and I said, well, I, I don't remember reading through the scriptures where he did that for anyone else. When people wanted to be healed, he simply touched them. When they wanted to be healed, they said, he would just say a word, you were healed. He did not talk about their spiritual need. He didn't say your sins are forgiven before he healed them. So why? Why now? Why? What? What was behind it? Well, there are two reasons that I discovered as I did some reflection and research on this passage. There are uh, two schools of thought. One, one, many scholars think and believe that Jesus simply wanted to encourage this man that his sins would not prevent his healing. You see, at that time, there was a general philosophy, an understanding about the nature of sin that said that, that people thought that if you were afflicted, if you ran into to hard times, if you were, uh, if you were oppressed, if you, if you were marginalized, if you were suffering uh, from any severe illnesses like uh, paralysis or, or, or leprosy or even blindness, or, or if you befell some tragic accident, they attributed that to a correlation with sin, that somehow your condition was caused by your sinfulness. And maybe even it wasn't your sins, it could have been the sins of your parents. You all remember the blind man brought to Jesus? And they said, Jesus, Jesus, why is this man, why was he born blind? Is it because he sinned or because of his parents? And Jesus said, it's neither, but that God's glory may someday come through, can shining through. So you see, Jesus, Jesus breaks through a long-standing belief system with a new understanding that not all illnesses and not all sicknesses are the result of one's sin. The second reason, the second reason that I discovered is that Jesus wanted to make it clear that he had divine authority to forgive sins on earth. It's right in the text. That is why he came. The teachers of the law miss that connection. And therefore, they dismissed Jesus in the process and then accused him, right, of blasphemy. Who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. I don't know about you this morning, church, but I thank God every day that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins on earth. I thank God every day. 
because if it was left up to some of us or some religious folk, our sins would define us forever. Is that right? So, so who does this guy think he is that he can forgive sins? Well, this encounter with, with the uh, was strike one against Jesus as he was confronted by the religious caste system of his day, but it wouldn't be the last. So as you well know, the religious leaders of Israel would be instrumental in having Jesus crucified. On up the road just a little bit. But Jesus was not deterred by the, by the opposition of the Pharisees and the elite teachers of the law, and he kept pushing back. As we move down through verses 8 and 9 of our text this morning, the text says that Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. Right? Nod your head. Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. Here's another little footnote, church. Here's another footnote. This is another missed sign of his divinity because only God knows our thoughts before we think them, right? I'm just saying. They missed it. And so without miss, missing a beat, Jesus then presented them with a riddle in this text. And he said to them, well, which is easier? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk? And because Jesus is who he is and has the authority that he's been given, he then gave the command. He gave the command to the paralyzed man and he said, I tell you, stand up, take up your bed and walk. And this text says immediately this man rose up and he picked up his mat and he walked out in full view of everyone and he went home. That's shouting news, church. I'm sure some shouts went out in there somewhere. He picked up his mat immediately and walked out. And at this moment, Jesus demonstrates his power to bring both spiritual, emotional, and physical wholeness. Jesus, my friends, I attest to you, is concerned not only with our spiritual, our spiritual healing, but with our bodies and our souls, about everything that touches our lives. So everybody in the house, the Bible says, was amazed, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this ever before. Once again, Jesus is displaying the benefits of his kingdom. But he continues to move in this text. And he moves now into an area of what I call his, his radical evangelism and radical discipleship. The action shifts in this text around 13 and 14, and Jesus is on the move. It says that he leaves this congested area uh, where this house was uh, in this crowded house in favor of an outdoor service down by the lake. And I do understand that you all know a little bit about some outdoor services. In fact, this is the second service that you've had back indoors and that there was some freedom uh, that you gained to be able to gather out to, outside on this beautiful ground to worship Jesus. Jesus did not wait for the crowd to come to him. He went to the people and he was walking along the lake shore, and the crowd was following him. He said he spots a tax collector named Levi. Now, Levi, of course, is also the same disciple that we call Matthew, so that you all have that straight in terms of how this progression of this call of this radical call to discipleship affected this, this tax collector named Levi. He was sitting at his tax booth, and Jesus said to him, as he said to the others, follow me. And just like the fishermen before him, Levi gets up and he follows Jesus. And the next thing that we know in this text, Jesus and his disciples are at a dinner party with Jesus as the guest honor, the honor who, who's there giving uh, uh, as the guest of honor. But around them, Levi has invited the who's who's of, of sinners in Capernaum. This is a virtual list of, of, of all of the most notorious undesirables 
who are now present at the table with Jesus and his disciples. And they're all wearing the hashtag Sinners for Jesus. And what I find striking, what I find striking in this text is that Mark tells us that there were many. Did you hear me? He said there were many, not just a few, who followed Jesus. That ought to tell us something right there. There were many who followed Jesus. The call of Levi was a call to radical discipleship. John Scott, the noted Anglican theologian, defines radical discipleship this way. He said radical discipleship is letting Jesus set the agenda for our lives. We aren't selective. We don't pick and choose what is congenial and what to, what, what stay, what to stay away from that because it's costly. We don't pick and choose. We aren't selective. We allow Jesus to set the agenda for our lives. Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Johnson of Lutheran Seminary, a Luther Seminary, writes in her commentary on Mark 2 regarding tax collectors these words. She says that the tax collectors were among the most notorious sinners who were particularly despised in Israel. They were viewed as collaborators or traitors to the Roman occupier who had placed a very heavy tax burden on the people. And because they dealt with, with the Gentiles and with Gentile monies, they were considered unclean. They were considered unclean and undesirable. In fact, they, their, their entire families were shunned because of that position. But please note this. Please note that Jesus took the initiative to establish a relationship with these bad hombres, these bad people. Jesus is breaking down long-standing cultural barriers that, that have been, that means that you don't have a meal, you don't come into proximity with those who are different and those who do not live the way you live, speak the way you speak, walk the way you walk, worship the way you worship those who are considered unclean and unworthy. He comes up close and personal. He becomes one with them. He identifies with them. He's not afraid to be seen with them. And in fact, he prefers to be seen with them. He extends the hand of friendship. He offers genuine acceptance to those who were told they would never be acceptable. They would never be anybody. That's who Jesus is. And that's how he responded to sinners, those on the outside. When the Pharisees, and by the way, it didn't matter to Jesus what caste you were part of. It didn't matter what your gender was, what your age was, what your demographic was, where you live, what side of the river you were on. He extended that to whosoever will to let them come. And so when the Pharisees, the Pharisees, these teachers of the law, these religious elite, these powerful people, when they saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners, they asked the question, why, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And the response was both profound and life-changing. These are the words that Jesus says. He said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that he came to save people who recognize their need for him. And if you didn't recognize that, you couldn't enter into this relationship. I would like to offer, in closing, an exercise that you can do just virtually inside your own minds this morning, or maybe reflect on it later over dinner. 
But I want you to reflect on who you identify the most with in this text this morning. Who do you identify with most? What would you say was your response from one of these categories of persons? Would you, would you be like the sinners, those who were called sinners, the ones who were far from God and knew that they were far from God, who struggled in many ways to think that God would, be, God would accept them, God would welcome them into fellowship with himself, even as they were? Or perhaps this morning, you're like Levi, the tax collector, willing to give up everything to follow Jesus and also extend that invitation, not just hold it to yourself, but extend that invitation to your friends and family, to your coworkers, to your social networks. Are you the kind of person who would say of yourself that you believe that God loves those others the same that he loves me, that he loves and values them as he loves and values me? Or maybe... Maybe you're more like Jesus, full of grace and mercy, an agent of reconciliation, seeking to be used by God to spread his kingdom to the ends of the earth. My friends, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It already is, and it is not yet. The kingdom is at hand. The king has already come. If you're caught this morning in sin, you need do nothing more than to cry out and ask for forgiveness and deliverance because the king says, follow me. If you are trapped in bitterness and hatred and pride, you simply just need to make a decision to follow Jesus and he will set you free. Jesus came to offer the only cure to the pandemic of sin, which was his body and his blood that was poured out for many for the remission of our sins. Well, I don't know about you, COS, my friends here, but I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world before me, the cross behind me, I have decided to follow him. Amen. Father, we thank you for this powerful word and invocation that your love knows no limits, no boundaries, no ethnic persuasions, no geographic limitations. You came that you may call those who need you the most because only you can do what we cannot do for ourselves. And so we thank you that we hear this powerful word about a God who sacrificed his life, the Son of God who sacrificed his life, the King of a new kingdom who come to turn the old kingdom upside down that indeed he would be busy putting new wine into new wineskins, introducing to us the new possibilities of relationships restored, brokenness healed, a world transformed. And so we pray that you would help us now to find our place in that kingdom movement, that we will be busy, open, and willing and ready to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.